Okay, folks, today we're covering one of Israel's most difficult and some would say darkest moments, Sabra and Shatila. Before we dig in, I got to tell you what I find to be one of the most fascinating aspects of human psychology. Ever hear the expression, we see what we want to see? That's because our brain tricks us, showing us what we prefer to see in a given situation. It's called desirability bias, and it can get in the way of seeing things as they actually are. So here's my ask. No matter how you view Israel, super positively, you love Israel, or super negatively, you're a hater, pay attention to this video, because it complicates whatever narrative you have. But I think we have what it takes to tackle this head on. I'm Noam, and you're watching The History of Israel Explained. Yalla, let's do this. To understand the dark story of Sabra and Shatila, we've got to mosey on back to a groovier time, 1964, the year that the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, was born. Okay, maybe it wasn't such a groovy time for Israelis, because in 1964, the PLO was a major thorn in Israel's side. Today, the organization's official website describes it as, quote, the embodiment of the Palestinian national movement, a broad national front, or an umbrella organization. But its 1964 charter tells a different story. It denies the Jewish connection to Israel and calls for, quote, holy war until complete and final victory has been attained. Yup, direct quote. When Yasser Arafat became the PLO chairman in 1969, he took that holy war to the streets. First, the PLO tried to assassinate the King of Jordan. Twice. Understandably, the Jordanian king booted them out of his country. By 1971, the PLO had set up shop in southern Lebanon. They made themselves at home by setting up a state within a state and terrorizing the locals. Oh, and attacking Israel. Their most gruesome attack came in 1979. Skip ahead if you're squeamish. Working with the Palestine Liberation Front, a Lebanese Druze teenager named Samir Kuntar crossed into Israel from South Lebanon. After murdering a police officer, Kuntar and his accomplices forced their way into the apartment that Danny Haran shared with his wife Smadar and two young daughters. Haran helped his wife and two-year-old into a crawl space above the bedroom. But before he could escape with their four-year-old daughter Ainat, Kuntar burst into the apartment. He forced Danny and Ainat down to the beach. Kuntar made Ainat watch as he shot and drowned her father. Then he smashed her head in. Meanwhile, Smadar cowered in her own home, frozen with fear. In an effort to keep the baby quiet, Smadar accidentally suffocated her. It's a story that could have come from Poland in 1942. The Israeli public was horrified. The next day, the IDF bombed a training base for Palestinian guerrillas in Lebanon, but the PLO was undeterred, sending a barrage of rockets into northern Israel. In 1982, a shadowy PLO splinter group attacked the Israeli ambassador to England. Finally, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin declared, enough is enough. Less than 72 hours later, IDF tanks rolled into southern Lebanon. Their goal? To establish a 25-mile buffer zone between Israel and the PLO bases that were the source of so many attacks. The IDF quickly established this buffer zone, but things got very messy very fast. Lebanon was already at war. Muslims fought Christians. Lebanese nativists fought the Palestinians who had flooded their country. Syria swooped in to exploit the power vacuum. Now the IDF was in the mix, hunting PLO operatives. The enmity between the Lebanese and the Palestinians was so bad that many Lebanese were thrilled to welcome the IDF. Israel found an ally in Lebanon's controversial Christian president-elect Bashir Jamayel, who yearned to rid his country of foreign influence. Hold up. If Jamal wanted foreigners out, why did he ally with Israel? Well, Jamal hated the PLO, who had done nothing but start trouble. He and Israel had common cause. Israeli politicians dreamed of peace with their northern neighbor. Unfortunately, roughly 60% of the country hated Jamal's guts. The president-elect had survived two assassination attempts, but his luck ran out in September of 1982 when a Syrian nationalist bombed his party's headquarters. All hell broke loose in Lebanon and in Israel. For the first time in Israel's brief history, many Israelis opposed the war. 
We got our buffer zone, protesters cried outside of Begin's office. We don't want to die in Beirut. A bereaved father even wrote Begin a searing letter. My beloved son is dead because of your war. Not our war, your war. And the anti-war sentiment was about to swell. Jamal's assassination came with serious repercussions. See, West Beirut was home to two Palestinian refugee camps, Sabra and Shatila, which the PLO used as a base of operations. The IDF had asked the Lebanese army to rout the PLO from the camps. The Lebanese army declined. They also refused to keep order in West Beirut in the wake of Jamal's assassination. So the IDF encircled West Beirut instead. Prime Minister Menachem Begin stated that the Israeli army was there to keep the peace, otherwise there could be pogroms. Israel turned to Jamal's political party, the Phalanges, which had a paramilitary arm. The Phalanges hated the PLO. They agreed to enter the camps and find PLO fighters. The Phalanges coordinated with the IDF. They passed through IDF unit lines on their way to Sabra and Shatila. Phalanges soldiers periodically asked the IDF to fire flares over the camps. It was dark, they said. They needed the illumination from the flares in order to see. So, the Israeli soldiers complied. When the Phalanges asked the Israelis to fire mortars, they did. The Israelis had faced gunfire and RPGs from the camps. They figured they were helping the Phalanges neutralize a PLO stronghold. But something was off. A Phalanges soldier came to the intersection where the Israelis were stationed. He bragged that the militia had already killed 250 terrorists. The Israelis rolled their eyes. There's no way those Phalanges bozos neutralized 250 terrorists in such a short amount of time, they said. The entire world would later learn that the Phalanges were counting civilians in that death toll. Over the course of two days, the Christian militia massacred, mutilated, and raped between 800 and 2,000 Palestinian refugees. All while the IDF illuminated their way with flares, not realizing what was going on. Though there's a whole debate about that. So it's time for the million dollar question. Was the massacre Israel's fault? Part of the Israeli public seemed to think so at least a little bit. Roughly 10% of Israelis flooded the streets in protest, holding signs like, if I forget Sabra and Shatila, may I forget Jerusalem. Rabbi Yehuda Amital, the head of Yeshivat Haaretzion, condemned the massacre as, quote, a sin not even Yom Kippur can cleanse. But others disagreed. Prime Minister Begin summed it up bitterly. Gentiles kill Gentiles and they blame the Jews. And then the Israeli government did something remarkable. It shone a light into its darkest corners, establishing the Khan Commission of Inquiry to find out what really happened. And by February of 1983, the commission had its verdict. Though the Phalanges committed the atrocity, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon was personally responsible. He and IDF Chief of Staff Rafi Eitan had allowed a Christian Lebanese militia into a mostly Muslim Palestinian camp during a civil war. The commission found that the Israeli government itself bore indirect responsibility for the massacre. Bacon didn't object when he learned the Phalanges were in the camps. He later claimed that no one could have predicted what the Phalanges would do. But the commission found that less than convincing. After all, Begin himself had said the IDF was in West Beirut to quote prevent pogroms. So the commission ruled that had he been more involved, Begin could have prevented the massacre. The commission acknowledged that responsibility for the atrocity lay with multiple parties, but the Phalanges and the Lebanese army showed no interest in investigating the matter. 13 horrific massacres punctuated the Lebanese war. In 1985, Lebanese Shiites and Syrians massacred nearly 4,000 Palestinians at Shatila. Needless to say, they never established a commission of inquiry into that massacre. Israel was the sole party with the integrity to investigate its own responsibility in a massacre. That doesn't turn Israel into a saint in this case, but it's an important thing to acknowledge. The IDF had entered Lebanon to stop the PLO's reign of terror and gotten horribly embroiled in a vicious sectarian war. But it was the only player in this war that was brave or ethical enough to look itself in the mirror, even when the reflection wasn't pretty. Because Israel's a democracy, and democracies aren't threatened by the truth, they're threatened by its suppression. Let's be clear, this is not Israel's shining moment, but I gotta say, after Sabra and Shatila, Israel demonstrated its willingness to confront difficult moments. 
Ultimately, that willingness isn't a source of weakness, it's a source of strength. It's what sets Israel apart. I don't think we should take that for granted. Like this video, want to learn more about the history of Israel? Subscribe, enjoy, keep on learning.